Welcome to the Look Good, Move Well podcast. Okay, yeah, we're back. We're back, everybody, and we are joined again by uh, Coach and Dr. Adam Fetter, who is Functional Bodybuilding Master Coach. Welcome back to the show. It's good to be back. And um, so you're in Marin. You formerly lived here for like a year, and then you've mm-hmm. been since then living in a couple different, well, actually all, always in Austin. All, you moved yep. straight to Austin. Correct. So you're in Austin. Um, what do you love about coming back to Marin? What's your favorite part of this place? It's the most beautiful place I've ever been. Seriously, the the nature in Marin, the just how beautiful everything looks is to me, that alone is worth moving here. Yeah. Yeah. Any spot in particular that like you just, when I go there, I really... <laughs> No, I mean, I was explaining this to my partner. I think when I go to different cities, something that I've picked up on recently is that bigger cities, so like Phoenix is the place that I I go often now because that's where she lives and um, everything is in a perfect square. Like it's a grid system just driving around. So all the roads are perfectly straight. And even in Austin, it's a lot of winding roads. There's no like perfect grid system. Mm-hmm. And obviously same here in Marin, everything's windy. You're on the top of a mountain, then you're at the very bottom of the mountain. You look to your side and there's the ocean. And then you look and there's the bay. And just that like um, not being in this perfect box and not being everything like perfectly straight to me is so appealing. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. if you go into San Francisco, which is like our big city and it's like a 20, 30 minute drive, like I think San Francisco is known for having just unique, you know, geography, right? Like oh, yeah. there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of major cities that have hills that are like as extreme. Yeah. People don't know it. Like you get on some of these hills and you, you feel like you're going on a roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. fucking wild. No, 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 you cannot. <laughs> yeah. I remember it's like, uh, they, they do like for a while, like the, um, they were doing this bike race, the tour of California yeah. and it started in San Francisco and there was like a, a time trial in this, in San Francisco. <laughs> like they would send these cyclists up this like gnarly hill. It's like kind of akin to like, no, certainly not as long, but to like the Alps, like yeah. you're going, uh, I don't even know what the grade is on these, but steep. Steep. Yeah, very steep. Steep. <laughs> steep. <laughs> um, Anyhow, cool. Well, we're excited to have you back. And today we're going to unpack a topic that you're, you know, uniquely qualified to to discuss and talk about. We get, um, it's, I don't know, weekly, every, every other week frequently. Hey, I just, uh, I, I hurt this or I tweaked this or something. Yeah. I get this in my DM. Like Marcus, I just like hurt this. What should I do right now? Mm -hmm. And Usually the question is like, the the question behind the question is like, I really, or I don't want to lose my gains and I just hurt myself. Like, what can I, what can I do? So I think what we want to focus on today is you've been acutely injured mm-hmm. and it's time to it, like, over assess, the assess, <laughs> assess, you know, create a plan of action, overcome, like, or maybe you're lost. Maybe you have no idea where to start. And so as somebody who's, you know, worked with a lot of patients, you've worked with a lot of clients as a strength and conditioning coach. Um, you know, oftentimes we get coaching clients that come to us that have had pain or in pain, you know, you're the go-to coach on staff to pair them up with, to work through this because you have such an experience with it. But, um, Anything else from for context to add to this, Satya, before we let Adam, you know, start to build a case for how to how to do this? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely add the mental and emotional layer because mm-hmm. I think that a lot of people, the question behind the question also hints at fear because they don't want to mess themselves up for the foreseeable future. They don't want to do further damage, but they also don't know, like, is this something that I could push through safely and for myself at least when I've been in those situations, just having the guidance of someone who's experienced in that area say like, you're okay to move this, like mm-hmm. that can really be a helpful tip. Yeah, I, I definitely wanna get into the specifics cause I know that's what will be helpful for people on having like practical application. But I think you said something that this is, 
something that's unique to me and that I know how to navigate injury. And I think that's exactly what I want to rewrite for people and that I think it should be fundamental to being a human that you know how to manage your own injury or manage your own pain. And I think, you know, helping people understand that you don't have to have a degree in education to understand some very simple concepts of how to navigate pain and how to navigate injury. You know, I think once I, I almost feel almost like a imposter syndrome when I start telling people of like, oh, well, maybe you should do this or maybe you should do this. I'm like, this stuff is seems so simple to me. And obviously, I, you know, I put my time in to, to learn some of these things. But even take that education away, if I just think back to had I used common sense in this situation and like really thought through how I'm feeling and just listened to what my body was telling me, I probably could have got myself to a pretty okay place to recover from this injury. So, yeah, I mean, if you go back far enough, like that's all people had. There were no like doctors or PTs or exercise pain specialists. There was just like, you know, you're on the hunt for whatever and you like tweaked an ankle because you like were chasing something and yeah. like okay yeah, well exactly. i'm not dead yet i got a boat busted ankle and now i gotta go and just chill out in the cave for a little bit yeah. mm -hmm. and then well i gotta get up and go and grab some water so i gotta keep moving and you know after a few months like oh my ankle feels better i'm back to doing stuff and i'm moving again and and yeah. what the, that was that the PT protocol. Yeah, pretty, I mean, pretty <laughs> the much. PT yeah. said, "Go into my cave, yeah. then just go get my water <laughs> every day." I think the. Um, have you ever read the book Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the Twenty First Century? Mm -mm. I think there's an example in there where um, the the author's child like breaks his arm, and the traditional method of 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 curing that would be to put a cast on on the child for a certain amount of time. Then you, you take it off and then you slowly, you know, resume normal activity. And I think they they didn't do that. And they're like, oh, you know, give some parameters to the child and help them like, hey, if this really hurts, don't do that. Try to do as much as you can. But be aware that if you're doing something that hurts a lot, don't do that as much or do it with less intensity. And I again, I think in the book is a long time ago when I read it. But I think that the healing process was far quicker and the outcome was far better than your traditional, you know, hmm. put a cast. I'm not saying don't don't do any traditional medicine. There's there's very much a reason for a lot of, you know, a lot of cases where that's appropriate. But, you know, I think the idea of just like listening to the body and and you know, taking in all the signs that it's telling you is a huge part of this process as to how to navigate acute injury. Yeah. And I'll just add one, one more, which I hear cited often is, um, you know, like the percentage of back injuries that, you know, will heal themselves. The percentage of back, excuse me, I guess it's the percentage people with back pain, like, I don't know, maybe you know this statistic or maybe you, but there's like a hundred percent of back pain resolves itself if given enough time. Like with, I mean, you, you don't spontaneously like, you know, heal a ruptured, you know, disc, but the pain that's associated with the ruptured disc, if given enough time, the body learns how to compensate around it and the pain goes away. 100%. I don't know the exact statistic, but I've had that experience with a lot of patients who, you know, people decide to not do, they have a, let's say lumbar disc herniation. They decide to get surgery. Their outcome ends up being, you know, the same, uh, roughly the same timeline as the person that takes the conservative treatment the whole time. And there's a lot of variety within individuals to how long this takes, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the lifestyle and, you know, are they continuing to train? Are they not training? Mm -hmm. But, you know, the outcomes end up being pretty similar in a, a pretty similar amount of time, just taking the conservative route. Well, Adam, in your experience working with people who are injured and coming to you for help, there must be a certain segment of people who get it right and they're like, okay, I'm going to do the common sense approach and kind of listen to my body. And then there's everybody else. And so yeah. like, what are the most common mistakes that everybody else falls into that could potentially be avoided? Yeah, I think the biggest mistake is people stop moving or stop training. And to address what you had mentioned earlier about like the emotional or mental aspect of pain and injury i think stopping training is one of the worst things you can do for that and i'll i'll cite i'll probably cite a couple of my injuries i think having a practical example is is helpful so a couple of years ago i dislocated my elbow really heavy snatch bad position 
elbow dislocation. Later that night, I back squatted more for my mental capacity of like, hey, I can still move. I can still train. I was squatting with one hand on the bar and one hand was not functioning. But I was like, wow, just for me to still move, there's definitely some physiological things that are happening that are helpful already with my elbow. Like I'm getting more blood flow. You know, I'm eliminating the pain in my arm because I'm using other areas of my body. There's there's things physiologically that are happening, but mentally knowing day one, hey, I can still squat and I can still do something positive for myself and for continuing my training process. That already was a huge win day one of a really, you know, aggressive injury. So I think to, you know, to your question, people need to figure out how do I keep training? What can I still keep doing? And I know the next, the next thing or question that usually comes up or the comment comes up from my clients or someone that's struggling is, well, you know, this isn't good enough. Like, you know, this isn't my normal program. I'm not doing everything to hundred percent. So why should I do anything? And I, I've been stuck in that trap. I fully understand that mentality, but, um, you know, I think continuing to, be accepting of your injury. And there's, you know, there's lots of transferable life lessons that come from an injury and acceptance or, or improving your ability to accept is, is definitely one of those things. And so I think the quicker you can accept that, Hey, you know what? I might not be able to bench press for the next six to eight weeks because I dislocated my elbow, but I can squat. I can do lunges. Hey, in a couple weeks, I might even be able to run. Maybe I do, you know, a, a training cycle where I focus on running and endurance. So to go back to my example, I was Olympic lifting primarily at the time. And, you know, the time in which which I was covering, as soon as I was able to move my elbow again, I was like, I'm going to do an assault bike training cycle. I'm going to do assault bike, like 30 to 60 minute sessions, three times a week and really push it. And how fun to be able to focus on something not related to my elbow at all. And also build up a different capacity of my fitness, you know, at the same time. Hmm. Well, that so, um, any other mistakes that people are commonly making around how they're approaching, you know, injury? I think, I think that is the, you know, the one I mentioned is probably the biggest. Another big one is kind of what we alluded to earlier is people aren't listening to the signs that their bodies are telling them, right. Of, you know, that, Hey, this, I'm doing this movement and it's aggravating my, my, whatever my injury is. And they'll, because, you know, there's ego associated with or, you know, this attachment to their old program or whatever they were doing previously. It's like, no, I have to keep doing this this way, even though my body's telling me I shouldn't do this, Mm. you know? And I think that is a really big mistake for people as well of like, yeah, take in the signs that your body's telling you, because oftentimes if you do the things that feel good and then you don't do the things that don't feel good, you're going to recover really, really well. Yeah. Even, even in, you know, I have sort of like guidelines of, or my own sort of protocols for different injuries that, you know, a client tells me they have these symptoms. I can kind of, um, associate it with a specific injury. And then I have a pro, you know, general protocols that I would use for that injury. But if there's an exercise or stretch for that specific person that didn't feel great, even though it feels great normally for that same injury, I'm going to say, Hey, yeah, let's not do that. Let's, let's modify it. Let's do something else. Maybe we reduce the intensity of that exercise and taking their symptoms as like the primary guiding light. I remember when I was a PT, I, I, I would hear other PTs always say, let pain be your guide. And it's like, what a, you know, what a great, what a great, um, phrase or, or mantra while you're recovering from injury of like, yeah, just let, let pain be your guide and really like truly listen to it. It's a huge, huge mistake I see people make. And again, I'm guilty of all the same mistakes that people are making, even with the, you know, my background and the knowledge Mm. that I have of, Hey, I'm attached to this. I'm attached to the snatch. I can't stop, you know, snatching or clean and jerking. I have to keep doing that even though it feels terrible for my body. But the more I've learned and as I continue to get more experience with my own training process and navigating injury myself, I really realize that if I just listen to my body, it's telling me everything that I need to know. I, that's interesting. I had, I mean, I can think of my experience early this year where, um, my shoulder really started to, you know, act up and I was pretty, I was like very committed to like sticking with the programs that I was following and like the progressions that I was, you know, really trying to, um, 
be consistent with. And I think what was probably the most aggravating was all of the traditional methods I had for like lifting and targeting shoulders. So like any, mostly like military press or any like, you know, seated vertical or vertical pressing, um, just really bothered it, but I kept going and I was like, I got to keep doing this. I remember a, a day in particular, and I think it's on video. There's like, I was like trying to do an AMRAP set on a, you know, strict barbell press. And I was training with Megs and Shauna and like, I just like failed and it was like grindy, crunchy failure. Mm. And I was just like, I, and I was like pissed at myself that I missed the, the progression. Not like this movement sucks for me right now. It maybe mm -hmm. sucks for me forever. Like this is not something I should be trying to push through. This is just doesn't feel good on my body. And once I got out of the pain cycle after it had gotten even worse, um, I've really spent the last six, seven, eight months, or I don't even know how many months it's been, but just like, okay, let me, this is going to be my guide to find other ways to train my shoulders that feel good. Mm -hmm. And like today in our training session, we did a weird, funky, like tricep of shoulder stuff, which was like a supinated barbell Smith press with a back support and some dumbbell laterals. And then this light cable thing. And I've been like guided to these new methods and these new movements in this slightly different approach to training shoulders because I had pain and these, this doesn't give me pain. And this makes my shoulders scream and like in a good way, like muscle activation, muscle tension, muscle pump, like feeling sore the next day, but having no crunchy grindiness in my shoulders. Uh, so it's, it's like, yeah, pain can be this guide to say, Hey, like, it's not like, okay, that, that road is closed off. It's just like, Oh, just veer to the side a little bit and do it this way or veer to the side and do it th that way. Mm -hmm. But how do you guide people through the right movements and the right effort for them? Because I think part of the recovery process is maybe some people would call it painful. Other people would call it uncomfortable. And I think a lot of people have a lot of different interpretations of what my body is telling me is okay versus not okay. Yeah, I think I think to address that most appropriately, it is nice to have some education, right? To understand that, okay, when I, you know, if I have, let's say I have a muscle strain, when I contract that muscle and when I stretch that muscle, it's going to hurt in both of those scenarios, right? So now I can already understand, hey, that's a contractile muscle issue, right? So there is, I think, some like low hanging fruit in terms of understanding the body or understanding physiology that is helpful to navigate those. But I, I would still, in a scenario where a client tells me, hey, this is uncomfortable. Okay. You know, how uncomfortable would you rate it one to 10? Okay. Okay. What's the most uncomfortable experience you've had in training? You know, tr trying to get a better understanding of their context of pain, you know, similar in the way that we use RP, like what is, what's your context of an RP nine, right? Like I know, you know, this person and this person aren't going to have the same nines nor in, you know, someone's uncomfortable and this person's uncomfortable is not going to be the same. So trying to get more context of what is uncomfortable for you and what does that mean to you? And I certainly, I have clients that I know are, you know, like really go-getters. They're the type of person that doesn't want to miss a training day, 100% compliant on True Coach, you know, I've never missed a workout. As soon as they say, hey, I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to say, hey, let's, let's take a little bit of time off that exercise. Let's try to find a different exercise that works for you. And then I have clients that will, you know, maybe they're not as consistent or, you know, maybe they're a little bit flaky with training. They might tell me, Hey, this exercise, I have a lot of pain with this exercise. I might say, okay, let's try it this way first. Maybe we tweak it a little bit. Maybe we just go a little bit lighter and that might be, all right, I already feel way better, you know? So I think to, to help someone who doesn't have a coach, um, ask yourself like what type of of what is your avatar? Like what type of archetype are you as a person? Are you the go-getter or are you like, you know, are you, do you feel pain in a lot of different moments in life, in a lot of different areas, you know? And, and I think that can help guide you of, okay, maybe, you know, this pain, I do need to work through it just a tiny bit or just like 
flirt with this a little bit more by manipulating the movement versus like the go-getter that rarely ever experiences pain. Like, yeah, you should just probably stop that for a short period of time, try something else. And then, yeah, come back to it when, you know, when you're feeling better, and you're not having any pain. So it's, um, cause we've said it here on the podcast before and we've tried to like come up with like a rule where it's like, well, if it's a, if it's more than a three out of 10, then you shouldn't do it. If it's less than a three out of 10 pain scale, then you're okay. That's just the discomfort associated with like moving through and creating a healing environment for your, um, but I, but based on what you just said, it's like, well, everyone's three out of 10 is, is quite different. You know, like somebody who's, a, you know, they're, they're, they are just that committed go getter like not like they'll never admit that they're above a three out of ten because they don't ever want to not do something mm-hmm. um so i think it's the three out of ten is representative of like he, moving through because you're saying that the biggest mistake people make stop moving okay you're injured mm-hmm. just had an acute injury we got to keep you moving right mm-hmm And what is a safe level of discomfort to move through? And what is an unsafe level of discomfort where you're actually limiting how quickly you can heal and perhaps maybe even in some cases making it worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, And by setting this arbitrary three out of 10, it's like, well, what does three out of 10 represent? Like, because there is no objective three out of 10 for anybody because everyone's so different. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think understanding for, you know, for people that are doing any sort of movement or any sort of training, understanding that every movement and behavior that you do is telling your central nervous system something. You're giving information. So even us sitting in the posture that we're sitting in is telling my central nervous system oh, maybe I don't need as much length in my hip flexors, or maybe I should be, you know, maybe I am more rounded in my upper back or in, you know, in my lumbar spine. So understanding that every, every movement that you do in training, you're re-ingraining something to the central nervous system or to the brain, right? So if I'm doing a movement and I'm, Hey, this kind of hurts, you could be patterning more pain with that exact same movement. So in your example of the, the military press, you know, military, your body, every time you start to do military presses has this small remembrance of, well, I had pain with this movement at one point, you know, I need to modify this movement if I want to do it at some point without pain. So kind of asking yourself, what, what am I ingraining into my brain or into my central nervous system by choosing to continue to do this movement or not? Mm. And you can look at it both ways of, you know, if I stop doing this movement altogether, I could be making that movement pattern or that specific exercise even more sensitive to my central nervous system, right? Like let's take, we'll take the military press again as an example. If you chose to, hey, I'm going to stop doing military press. I'm not going to do this again for a year. When you come back to doing military press in a year, you might be so sensitive to that movement pattern or that specific exercise that it might elicit pain again. Whereas there's, there's a nice line where can I start to train this movement pattern or similar to this movement pattern in a pain-free way that allows me to desensitize that in the central nerve system or in the brain. And, you know, the example of, of the, the, we did a, a tri set of exercises today for basically all, you know, shoulder related stuff. Those are all, uh, exercises for you that aren't painful. So you're telling your brain, Hey, I can start to press in this vertical plane without any pain and you accumulate more and more reps of that, then you're going to be back to a traditional military press in no time because you've accumulated all those positive reps for your central nervous system. Mm. So I think, you know, again, to answer your question, I think ask yourself, like, what am I telling my brain by continuing or not continuing to do this exercise? Right. Yeah. Which is still hard for people to, it's still hard to to know. Sure. Yeah. We might not arrive at like, okay, this is the recipe that everyone can follow. But I think what I'm hearing you say, and this is really, um, it really hits home for me. It's like part of the movement process is not, well, excuse me, back up the pain process and the pain that you're experiencing is really multifactorial. It's not just a connective tissue or soft tissue, uh, injury or, you know, disruption. It's 
that that is contributing that may be contributing to it it may have nothing to do with it but the perception of pain is a is a neurological input Mm -hmm. it's something that's coming into our brain and, and our brain is then perceiving that based upon our life experiences how what how sensitive we are to it like mm-hmm. um you know whether you grew up around people that just like had giant cuts on their arms and they just didn't focus on it and you're like oh you're just not supposed to yeah you know like pain's not supposed, i'm supposed to feel like there's so many factors here but there's there's without question this neurological component and the movement or lack of movement could be impacting your perception of the pain and it's like Mm -hmm. if you stop moving it completely you could sensitize yourself even more to the pain and therefore uh every time you have to move that joint or that muscle in your day-to-day activity it's going to feel way more painful than if you go and do some you know uh conscious repetitions of movement it's like okay i got in the gym i moved my shoulder a bunch like my shoulder feels shitty but i went and did a bunch of lightweight presses i went and did a bunch of lightweight lateral raises i did some movement with it and there's nothing that's going to happen in the rest of my day that would maybe even be as demanding as that so mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a little bit of discomfort, but like I didn't have any stabbing pains. I just moved through it in the gym. And then the rest of the day, my nervous system gets to chill out and not feel like it's in pain and not feel like it's guarding that thing. And that is going to promote, you know, a better outcome or maybe faster healing, which could be the tissue healing or it could just be your brain's perception of the pain. And then you come back and you keep doing the movements and you keep the training and then you overload that training bit by bit. And it's essentially making the other 23 and a half hours in your day when you're not doing the shoulder exercises like less painful mm-hmm. because you've given positive inputs mm-hmm. to your brain that like, hey, this thing is okay. Like you're actually not, you know, it's not about to fall off. Yeah, that dissociation between structure and pain neurologically, I think is also, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is something that most people don't understand and I think is really important for people to understand. And so, you know, there's a lot of people walking around with torn meniscus, torn rotator cuff, lumbar disc herniations, and having no pain whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And there's people that are in extreme pain without having any structural damage, right? So it tells us that it is these, these two components. And when you were, when you were talking about that, it made me think of one of my favorite patient stories that I love to tell. Um, I had a patient when I was working in a traditional orthopedic clinic and Um, he was coming consistently for PT, like every week or every other week for about two years. Like, you know, he would come in, um, you know, my elbow hurts today. Next time he would come in, my knee hurts today. It was all, there was always something going on. There was always something. And every time I would like screen him, I would do an assessment structurally, nothing. It didn't seem like anything was really bothersome. I could assess his movement pattern and think, oh, maybe it's this, or maybe it's this. He was just coming in for personal training. Structurally, he was (laughs) structurally, you know, nothing wrong. He towards like the end of the, you know, the end of, you know, towards the end of this story, I guess he starts dating someone and at the, you know, he's like one month, two month into the relationship. And he's like, he comes in one day. He's like, yeah, I actually don't have any pain today. You know, like nothing's wrong with me. Like I feel great. You know, again, you know, comes in two weeks later, same thing, no pain. I could directly correlate him being more fulfilled potentially in life by, you know, having a partner now and like mm-hmm. having all these great positive experiences. And now he's in no pain. You know, I was like, mm. wow, what a, you know, light bulb moment for me. I, you know, I'd had plenty of teachers and, you know, I understood the concept of, of chronic pain and they have told me, you know, like there's, there's so much more to pain than just structure, but yep. to see this example, like so directly in person, I was like, wow, like this is, this is such a light bulb moment. And I, and I think that's, you know, again, a part of this whole equation for people is, yeah, just like take check on, you know, you don't need to start dating someone else or, or start dating someone if you're <laughs> in it. In, 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 in it might help honestly, but you know, but, um, you know, I think like assessing, yeah, like wh- what's your stress levels like? How mm-hmm. are you sleeping? How are you eating? You know, all those things are right. hugely playing into, you know, whether like how you, how you manage pain or how you associate pain in your, in your body. Can we, can we talk about anatomy for a second though? Because 
you recently told me that I have terrible levers for front squatting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, people who have your levers don't front squat. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm not ready to give up front squatting. So it's like, you know, how much of this is... I guess, negotiable, <laughs> you know, when it comes to like the limitations that you have to work with. Yeah. I mean, I think your, your example is great. You had pain in your back, correct? Yeah. Right. Pain in the back from uh, one specific front squat. Right? It was acute a cute situation. Yeah. Correct? I tweaked it on a heavy front squat and then I felt okay for a week and then I tweaked it again the exact next time. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, having like this repeat offender type scenario that, you know, what, kind of what we were talking about earlier, Pain is a request for change. And uh, I think I stole that from Kelly Surratt. Like I heard that and was like, wow, brilliant. We were kind of alluding to it earlier, but, um, you know, pain being a a request for change is, hey, I have this multiple incidents where I have a painful experience because of this exercise. So to me, that's a request for change. You could not front squat, right? And that might be all you need to do to, to address the pain, right? I know myself and and you as well, like you don't want to give up front squatting or you don't want to give up a specific exercise, but we certainly need to modify now the way that we're performing exercise, this exercise, because the way we were doing it clearly didn't jive well with my body. Right. And so, you know, the way I can, maybe I move my feet out. Maybe I gain 20 more degrees of hip flexion. Or, oh, I thought or you were going to say 20 more pounds. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that would change the mechanics too. You need, too. Is you need you know? a little bit more girth up in there <laughs> and you're going to bounce out of that and your back's going to have a nice, tight. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, to this point, you know, I think that's another area for people to check in with of, hey, I have pain with this exercise or I had an injury from this exercise. Okay, one, you know, can I perform this movement better? How's my movement quality, right? It, I'm doing a deadlift. Am I, do I have that super rounded back position? Yeah, we know that's generally maybe not a good thing. So maybe we shouldn't do it that mm-hmm. way. But then, oh, maybe I need to gain a little bit more mobility in the joints associated with that movement, right? You know, maybe for you in the front squat, you gain 10 degrees more of hip flexion and, you know, five degrees more of, of hip internal rotation, five degrees more of ankle dorsiflexion. You might not have any issue with it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, from just my experience, like certain body types are going to thrive in certain exercises and, and not in other exercises. And, you know, it's okay. It, you know, you can accept that or, or not, but if I'm not going to accept that, Hey, I'm the type of person that potentially shouldn't do this exercise. Well, then I better have all the, the necessary mobility to do this exercise before I start to load it heavier and heavier and heavier. Or, you know, even in, you can look at, you know, was I doing it two times a week or three times a week? You know, oh, maybe I only need to do it once a week. And that's the right, you know, the right call for me. So all in all, you know, when you have this painful experience, it is a request for change, right? So it's Mm -hmm. like something needs to change. And to your point earlier, Marcus, like maybe it is just a detour, you know, maybe I need to build up something somewhere else Mm -hmm. or gain more mobility before you come back, you know, before I start to come back to this movement. Yeah. Well, uh, we're, uh, what I, as like a closing thought that I have, um, is one of my biggest, uh, one of the biggest things that I have tried to advocate for is because we're, you know, um, I think the narrative at least from the orthopedic community or the medical community has been like, you know, boom, like you just got injured. Let's go and investigate the structural damage and then let's fix the structural damage and send you on your way. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what we've discussed today is that there's, there's validity and then there's big holes in that. That's that, that whole paradigm Mm -hmm. um because the pain that's associated with an injury may or may not have anything to do with the structure and Mm -hmm. you know you gave the example of people walking around every day with you know these structural issues in their bodies that they're not even aware of because they don't have any pain and they might never know they might never know that they have a torn meniscus or acl or you know lumbar uh disc herniation um, because that person doesn't have pain with it, whereas this person does. So mm-hmm. the idea that, okay, something is torn, I need to go fix it, mechanically fix it, or I can't do anything until it's fixed, or and that's what I've always tried to, like, in the best of my ability, coach and teach people. And then mm-hmm. also remember for myself, like, hey, I, 
I remember like I had a conversation with you a couple of years ago where um, I've had recurring shoulder stuff on the right side. This was like three or four or five years ago. And I maybe, maybe three, I don't know. I was asking you, like, I'm like, I have this pain, you know, this like stiffness and this, like what feels like pain, like after I do like heavy deadlifts and it, my shoulder and you were like, kind of just doing like a general, like talk assessment. And you said something like, yeah, it sounds like you probably have a torn labrum and that's probably what's going and the moment I heard, like, I have a fucking torn labrum, mm -hmm. like, it sent me down a very, like, bad sp thought spiral. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm broken. Oh, there's something that's wrong with me. Like, and I know that wasn't your intention, but that is connected to this story and this narrative that I had heard for years. Like, if you have a torn thing, you're doomed. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and here I am years later, like, you know, in, in that process, like, I've done hundreds of muscle ups I've done walked on my hands I've you know jerked 260 or 275 over my head I did this crazy shoulder pump session we did today like I've done a lot you know and it's uh and you you didn't like see an MRI like you don't know but like there you know I'm now more comfortable with the idea of like yeah I probably have a torn labor my like I talk about it just like yeah I think my labor is probably messed up from, you know, whatever I did in CrossFit for years or who knows when it actually like got grid league for sure. That's, <laughs> that's where it went down. <laughs> it was that last race. Oh my God. I had to do 285 for freaking 10. Um, touch and go jerks at 285 for like a set of six, just like with four belts on my body and did like wrist. That off the floor too? No, my buddies picked oh. it up for me. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it was the human rack. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's just my closing thought is that look, this idea that like, you, the structure and the the breaking of your structure mm -hmm. is this kind of death sentence to your movement. Like you're never going to be able to, yeah. move. it's, uh, it's not true. And it, it is, um, it doesn't make the, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be a delicate process and that there's going to be emotions and, you know, repatterning pain and n the neurological components that we talked about. But, um, the path back is through movement Mm -hmm. And we have to encourage people to move smartly mm -hmm. and everybody's path through movement's different. And, you know, if it's a, if it's a small injury, like use common sense, you can navigate it. Mm -hmm. If it's a big injury, like you, you could use common sense, but it might help be helpful to have, you know, an educated and very well-practiced, uh, coach who's experienced hundreds of these things who can say, okay, yeah, like I've seen this before, like we're going to be all right. Like, let's do this. Let's make this adjustment. Um, so that's my, my closing thought. Any, anybody else have anything else to add here? I'll give, um, you know, maybe a little bit more practice, just a couple practical, like acute injury takeaways. You know, I know right. people are always looking for like, you know, what I do today. Rice, bro. Right. Rice. Like, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think one good one, my, my mom told me, has told me this my whole life, 48 hour rule. You know, wait 48 hours before you you doomsday everything and make the worst. Right. A lot mm. changes <laughs> in it's, it's so hard to do. A lot changes in 48 hours after you tweak something. And mm. so giving yourself that time to like, hey, calm down, you know, like <laughs> relax a little bit. Mama don't Fetter make don't make like, uh, you know, uh, a death sentence for yourself on this is, you know, I, I have this injury forever. It's like give it 48 hours. Um, and then, you know, managing inflammation in the acute phase of an injury is really, really important and going to really, really help with your pain. The greatest anti-inflammatory is movement. So can, which to our first point of this entire podcast, after you hurt yourself, try to keep moving, you know, just general blood flow to the body is going to be significantly helpful. You know, Hey, let's say you can't move that joint. Okay. Yeah. Doing some hot and cold therapy might be a good solution for you, but you know, maybe, you know, I hurt my shoulder and I can hop on a bike still and still get some general blood flow into my body. Blood is flowing in and out of your shoulder, even when you're moving your legs. So even that is going to help significantly. And the more close or specific you can get the blood flow to the area that that is painful or that you injured is ideal. So long as you're not eliciting more pain with that experience. And then, you know, Marcus, I know we've talked about this and I'm sure it's been in some of the YouTube videos in the past or, or other podcasts, maybe about pain, but isometrics is another great way to continue to train that specific injury or that specific area of the body when you are in an acute setting. And so I think, you know, if we look at what's occurring during an isometric, so, you know, let's say, um, 
what's a good example i you know i i hurt my back and i want to do some form of an isometric of the muscles in and around my back okay well maybe i just get on my back and do a dead bug or i do a plank right and i'm just isometrically contracting those muscles around where the injury one that's going to significantly help with your signaling of pain to the brain Mm -hmm. but also structurally you are getting a lot more blood flow to that area with that specific exercise so even structurally things are changing you know at the cellular level by doing some form of isometric so again the practical takeaways i think you know wait 48 hours before making too many assumptions continue to get as much blood flow as you comfortably can yeah if you can perform some isometrics as well great you're going to set yourself up really really well and then you know to what we talked about earlier let pain be your guide and um you know that will continue to guide your process of reintegrating back into your normal training system yeah. as time continues to move forward from the injury and some you brought this up earlier satya but the person who's like but i can't do my full training session so why even bother i think this is just this is the reminder that yes like you want to get back to a fully functional, fully operational system that can challenge your training and push yourself and get back on the path of progressive overload. And the quickest path to doing that is continuing to do a low level, a lower level of work. Mm -hmm. And when I hear people say like, I'm just going to grind through it. I'm going to keep grinding through it. I'm like, you're grinding through it at 80% is worse then if you take 30% for a couple weeks Mm -hmm. and then go to 70 and then go to 90 and then you're back at 100 and you're crushing, Mm -hmm. the person that's trying to stay at 80% is gonna then be at 70% and they're just gonna prolong that point of when they have to actually back off and come back. So um, anyway, that's it. Great point. Awesome. Call, Call it out? Yeah. Send them out? All right, well, thanks for joining us. And if you have any questions, follow up questions for Adam. You can slide into the DMs at Adam Fetter. I don't even know if Adam checks his DMs. Do I do. I do. Surprisingly, <laughs> it might be a little delayed. Maybe like give me a, a give me the 48 hour window to respond to the okay. DMs, but I will get back to them for sure. So slide into Adam's DMs or as always, you can slide into my DMs or Marcus's at Marcus Philly at Satya Khan with any follow up questions. Boom. Thank you for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next time. Yeah.